Okay, so how is everyone today? All right, so uh, there's an exam uh, on Friday. Next Friday. Two, two Fridays from now. Aha, okay. uh -huh. but I got your attention, huh? So that's uh, five plus seven days, okay? Five plus seven days. Uh, there's an exam. Yeah. Good. Notably, notably, it's at seven o'clock in the evening. <laughs> that means that it's you know not in here at this time. <laughs> okay, good. So today's the seventeenth. You know, and, and to that end, you know, I just want to remind you that, uh, you know, the way, the way it works is that, uh, you know, y'all are, you know, uh, just a handful of all the students taking 24-14, and uh, all the 24-14 students take their exams at the same time, and then, you know, all, all that the instructors can do is just tell the registrar, hey, we, we need, you know, 543 students to take an exam at the same time, and they say, great, you can take it on Friday at 7 p.m. <laughs> Okay, so we, you're, the instructors, including me, think that's about as awesome as you do. <laughs> and that's about all I can say about that. Good. So, uh, good. Let's let's get to it. Uh, when we left last time, we were we were talking about uh, improper integrals, and so in the end, the main idea is that uh, is that uh, an integral. An integral. So, shh, 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 I, uh, I really can't. I have difficulty concentrating in the best of conditions. <laughs> so when people are talking, it's just out the window, for me. Uh, so an integral. Uh, remember that uh, integral is uh, geometrically uh, associated to a signed, a signed area, positive, negative area. That's what it is. So an integral is improper uh, when uh, the uh, shape uh, for signed area that the integral corresponds to is unbounded. So we uh, we saw uh, a, cu a couple of examples. Okay, so then, in the first place, it could be it could be that the shape in question is uh, vertically unbounded. So that means like uh, it's approaching like a vertical asymptote. Say, it could also be the case that uh, the the region of integration is unbounded. So you know, like maybe you're you're integrating from five to infinity. And as a result, uh, it's unbounded. So a quick, a quick, uh, but accurate way to conceive. Uh, whether or not a shape is unbounded is to ask, can I draw a circle around it? Even if the circle is really big, it could have radius, you know, the size of the galaxy. Okay, but if you can draw a circle around it, it's bounded. Otherwise, it's not. So uh, here's, here's an example. We were working on this last time. So integral uh, zero, uh, 0 to 5, I think. I can't remember of logarithm of w dw. So innocuous enough. Uh, however, um, as it turns out, this integral is going to be improper. Now, why? Ln never reaches zero. I'm sorry? Ln never reaches zero. All right. Uh, so it has to do with, you know, how does, uh, you know, what does this, uh, what is this, this signed area look like. So it would be this. So as a sketch, as a sketch, it would look like this. So logarithm of uh, one is what? Zero. It's zero. Now from here, it uh, goes up, you know, quite slowly. In a sense, as fast as uh, 
as fast as a exponential goes up, <laughs> that's a logarithm has inverse behavior. This goes to the right super quick. Okay, then uh, we go down, and then uh, you know all, all the way down like that. So that's going all the way down, and uh, we want to integrate from uh, from zero to five. So if this is five right here. then uh, there's kind of, you know, two shapes, two, two bits of shape. Here's the, here's the bit of the shape that we're accounting positively. So we'll account that, that area positively. And then this, we'll also counting this area because it's the, it's the, the signed area uh, between zero and logarithm. So this all is negative. And then how far down does this, uh, does this bit go? Forever, right? So no matter where you center a circle, and no matter how big you make its radius, once you draw it, there'll be a little tail end of this that is, that, and not a little, right? <laughs> a very long tail, an infinitely long tail that is not in that circle. So this is not bounded. So can you see that uh, as a result of, of this shape being unbounded, the, uh, the integral is improper? OK. So then let's, uh, let's Come, let's truncate it to a proper place, and then uh, and then calculate that integral. Okay, so then uh, two. So we're going to truncate. So now, what I want you to see is that uh, is that you know this it's this place over here uh, zero that constitutes the problem. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take this interval, 0 to 5, and uh, instead of integrating 0 to 5, what if we cut it like, you know, like right there, say? What if we were to cut right there? So I could say let. Now I need a variable. What variable do you want to use? Can't be w. Phi. Phi? All right. So let, uh, let uh, phi be in 0 to 5 like this. You said phi, right? Yeah. Okay, good. I'm gonna I'm gonna make good work of of phi and five. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna let it be in there, and uh, that means that phi is some number uh, that's in between on the line there, in between my index fingers, but not zero and not five. Okay, and then just just for the sake of the drawing, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and draw it even to the left of uh, one. Uh, so, I'll, so in that case, uh, I could consider consider the integral from phi to five. Uh, my brain is working hard. I'm trying to get some kind of phi phi fo fum thing going, but I can't. Uh, I can't do it <laughs> and do this exercise at the same time. So I'll just keep going, I guess. So I'll draw a picture of this. Here's zero. Here's one. And I'll say that this here is uh, is phi. Right there. And I need a I need five. So then, you know, log still continues going down that way. But uh, do you observe that the signed area that we're talking about is now bounded? So that's the, that's the part that we reckon to be positive. And then uh, here's the part that we reckon to be negative. And do you observe that uh, we cut uh, all that uh, very long tail off? It's gone, right, out of consideration? This is now proper. Uh, as a result, uh, we're gonna we can do this one. 
Now, you might ask, well, why are we going to do that one? The reason why we're going to do it is because if we, if we, uh, if we integrate phi to 5, that will give us some number. And uh, in, in particular, uh, it, will be, it will be a formula in terms of uh, phi. And, you know, to get to the original problem, where do we want phi to be? Right, we want it to be at zero. So if it's here, if it's right here where I drew it, that's surely not the correct answer. But if I, if I were to just, you know, nudge it over a little closer to zero, I'd be closer to the correct answer, right? And then if I were to nudge it even closer still, I'd be closer still to the correct answer. So what we're going to do is we're going to integrate this, as written, and uh, then we're going, to let, we're going to compute a limit. What limit? The limit as phi goes to zero, zero the place where we need it to be. Uh, and in particular, it has to go to zero from the right-hand side. You, you can't uh, have it coming to going to zero from the left, right? Okay. So uh, let's calculate. So integral phi to 5 logarithm w dw. And now that we're doing a proper integral, it would be terrific if we could use the fundamental theorem of calculus, which is to say uh, we'd like to consider the corresponding antiderivative. So ignore that it's an integral for a moment and ask, What's the antiderivative of the logarithm of w dw? Nah. So that's the most common wrong answer. So I'll write it down, what, what I heard. So 1 over w. So this makes the greater sad. A little tear there. So that's not right. Uh, rather, something that it, something, this is not correct, but uh, something that's similar to it that is correct is that the, deriv the derivative of logarithm is 1 over w, but not the antiderivative. Okay, so then uh, what about it? Yeah? You're close. You're close. Minus w. So it's logarithm w multiplied by w and then subtract w. And in fact, if you, if you flip a couple pages back in your notes, you'll see that we actually did this one. In what section did we do this one? If you don't know, you don't know. We did, we did it in the bipart section. Ah, so remember, biparts is a thing. Yeah? <laughs> Anti-differentiation by parts is a thing? All right. Good. So I'm just uh, going to proceed with that knowledge, you know, so you've got to be able to do by parts. So uh, equal. So we did it uh, by parts. Uh, doing it by parts, uh, we get the following. We get that uh, the antiderivative would be logarithm of w multiplied by w and then subtract w. And now we have to evaluate that from phi to 5. So that's the antiderivative, and now we need to do the boundary evaluation. Wait a minute. If I say L'Hopital, do y'all know what that means? Is that a thing that y'all do in 2413? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> uh, so this would be logarithm of 5, multiply 5, subtract 5, and then subtract logarithm phi, multiply phi, subtract phi, like that. So that's, uh, you know, that's the answer. So that's how much area there is in that shape, that truncated yet proper shape. But uh, we wanted to know how much area is in that shape. And uh, the, way that, uh, you, the way that you do that is to do what? Yeah. So now, you calculate the limit as phi goes to 0 from the right. OK, so let's calculate that. So the limit phi goes to 0 from the right of all that. So log 5, multiply 5, subtract 5, subtract logarithm phi, multiply phi, 
subtract pi. So most of this is, is uh, very uninteresting, right? So in particular, logarithm 5, well, that's, that's a constant because 5 is a constant. And then you multiply it uh, by 5, that's still a constant. You subtract 5, that's a constant. So all this stuff here is a constant. Okay, so then that uh, just comes out. So this would be, this would be uh, logarithm 5, multiply 5, subtract 5. And then now uh, that uh, subtraction I'll, can distribute uh, and we'll get, get what? I'll say, uh, how do I want to do it? Like this, I guess. The limit is phi goes to zero from the right. Oops. Logarithm phi times phi minus phi, like that. So the subtract phi is easy. Why is that easy? What's going to be its limit? Zero. Zero, right? In the end, because, uh, well, just, just concerning just that right there, uh, that's a polynomial in phi, right? A polynomial of degree one. So uh, because, it's, uh, because it's a polynomial, it's continuous, and uh, computing the limit of a continuous function is the same as plugging in. So you can just plug in zero for that. But uh, this one is more interesting. Why is this one more interesting? Well, yes. The logarithm of zero is undefined. That's true. Uh, but that, but we're, not, we're not at zero. We're computing a limit as we go to zero. So where does the logarithm of uh, phi go as phi goes to zero? It goes to negative infinity, right? So it goes whoosh. So this factor is going to negative infinity, and that one is going to zero. So the negative is not relevant. The issue is that, uh, is that uh, we've got something going to infinity multiplied by something going to zero, right? And the question is, uh, who wins, you know? Is uh, if something's going to zero but really slow, and it's being multiplied by something that's going to infinity but really fast, the bigger one wins, right? You, know, you can imagine it like, you know, you can imagine, what if you have a, a pizza, okay, and we keep cutting it into more and more pieces, and then you might be concerned, oh, I'm not going to get a piece of pizza, you know, because it'll be too thin. You won't get a slice. But what if at the same time the pizza is also growing? <laughs> you know, so then, uh, so then it, whether or not you end up getting a slice at the end depends on how fast the pizza is growing and how fast the slices are being cut. So how do we address it? So logarithm fives, multiply five, subtract five, and then minus limit phi goes to zero from the right. Log phi times phi. Uh, and then subtract zero because I, you know, I plug that in, that one. Okay, so then now, uh, looking at this one, you know, what I want you to see is that, uh, is that uh, currently this limit is of the form infinity multiply zero. Inf it's, not, it's definitely not equal to infinity multiplied by zero. That doesn't mean anything, but uh, it's in that form. Uh, so this is a sick limit. So we need to take it to the hospital, <laughs> right? right? Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pause this. I'm gonna pause this, and then I'm just gonna so I don't have to keep writing that uh, these other bits, and I'm just gonna pull it pull this out and just just deal with it. So we we're gonna take it to the hospital. Uh, good. Which is it's even kind of funny, right? Because you know French is not the same as English, obviously. And uh, one of the ways to write l'hôpital uh, is using an S, and it looks like hospital. But that S doesn't, evidently doesn't mean an S in English. I don't really know. Uh, so then it's, it's in this form, like that. And uh, what I'm going to do is, uh, it's, instead of multiplying by something, 
you can divide by its reciprocal, right? Or if you like, instead of dividing by a fraction, you can multiply by its reciprocal. So what I'm saying is that, uh, in fact, the way we can view this is that uh, I'll view it as, instead of viewing that as a multiplication, I'll view it as a division. And if I view it as a division, what needs to be down here? Instead of multiply by phi, I'm going to divide by one over phi. Right? Because dividing by one over phi is the same as multiplying by phi, right? Y'all did L'Hopital's rule, right? Okay, good. <laughs> I'm kind of getting some blank looks here. Uh, so now, uh, that being the case, uh, the numerator is going to negative infinity, and uh, the denominator is going to positive infinity. So that means that uh, the purpose of making this change from this from this product inde indeterminate form, the purpose of saying multiply by phi is the same as divide by one over phi, is that now we're in this indeterminate form. So I guess that's really negative right there. And this would be negative infinity over infinity. And uh, now that it's one of these ratio indeterminate forms, that means we can use L'Hopital's rule. So what's, uh, what is L'Hopital's rule? Right, you, can, you calculate the derivative of the numerator. So what's the derivative of logarithm phi? 1 over phi. And then what is the, uh, what is the uh, derivative of just 1 over phi now? So remember, so what I'm asking is that what is the derivative with respect to, with respect to phi of 1 over phi? And I'll write, one o I'll write 1 over phi as phi to negative 1. Right, so it would be negative one multiplied by phi to negative two. So as, as you say, so that'd be uh, negative uh, one over phi squared, like that. Now, strictly speaking, it's still in that form, right? Because this is still going to, uh, what? Where's the two? Uh, but that, but uh, only if I differentiate again, right? So this negative one went to the front. Did I miss a two somewhere? I don't think so. So the two, this two would be as if we differentiated yet again. Uh, so this is still this is still in the indeterminate form, infinite over infinite. So shall we use L'Hopital's again? No, why not? Yeah, now we can algebraically do stuff, right? So then this would be the limit as phi goes to uh, zero from the right. And then I'll write it as one over phi and then multiplied by the reciprocal of that. So that would be negative phi squared, uh, negative phi squared over one like this. Okay, then uh, you know we've got that negative some of the fees cancel, we end up with uh, phi goes to zero from the right, negative phi, and then uh, what is it? Zero. All right. So then that consideration being made, that means that uh, continuing that, this is equal to Logarithm 5, multiply 5, subtract 5, minus 0, minus 0. OK, so then just uh, logarithm, logarithm 5, multiply 5, subtract 5. That's the answer. Terrific. Any question about it? So what this, what this means, you know, since it was in the form uh, infinite multiply 0, so this thing is getting real big. That one's getting small. And uh, as it happens, uh, you know, in this, in that kind of sense, this thing gets small quicker than that thing gets big, because it, because the product ended up being zero. You have a question? Here? Right, because well, okay, one over phi. If you plot it. 
if this is the phi axis, then uh, the shape of 1 over phi is the hyperbola. And then the question that uh, you, you ask is, is the same thing as saying that uh, what if we were on the red and we started moving toward the origin? Where would we go? All the way up. Other questions? Okay, good. So, uh, you know, this one is improper because it's uh, unbounded this way. Uh, the, the last one of the ones we did last time was improper because the, uh, the, the region of integration was infinite. So it was something like, I don't know, like 3 to infinity or something like that. Uh, here's an interesting one. And uh, this will be, you know, we'll, uh, well, OK. I'm going to do, do something super quick here. Uh, so if we do uh, integral, say, 1 to infinity, like this, and uh, I do, say, 1 over x, uh, just like that, 1 over x. Well, no, I'll say it like this. Last time, we did something just like this, and we determined that uh, there was an answer, okay, that uh, there was some amount. I can't remember what it was. It doesn't really matter. Uh, but uh, this, this exists, so see last time. So we uh, we took this we 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 said oh it's imp the the shape is unbounded so the integral is improper so we cut it and then we said oh yeah we cut it now it's proper and then we integrated it, and then we said okay now we're going to let the the that symbol go to infinity and then we calculated we got a number it, it exists uh, how about this one so now the only distinction between the one that we did last time in this one is, uh, you know, when you don't write an exponent, what is the exponent understood to be? One. one. So I'm going to write. I'm going to write it, though. You know, notice that you know you don't usually write that. So the only the difference here is that uh, two to one. So because this one exists, it, you know, it seems reasonable that this one should exist. Yet that will just simply not be true. So uh, in particular. Uh, We'll, we'll, I'll, I'll show you how it's uh, usually, how, once you get to accustomed to doing these, you can do it like this. So this is improper because the region of integration is unbounded. So we can cut the region at some place that's beyond 1. So we have to give that place a name. What do you want to call it? Delta? delta? Okay. So uh, integral 1 to delta, 1 over x dx. Now, that, you know, this is, this is for some delta that's more than 1. So that means that, uh, you know, closer, <laughs> you know, closer to infinity than 1 is. Uh, but after we calculate this, this is now, this is now proper. What are we going to do with delta? Once, once we calculate this, what do we do with delta? We calculate a limit. So here's all of the steps wrapped up uh, together. So this is how it, you can write it, you know, all at once. You know, if, if you had a mind to do that. So this is saying, you know, because of the order of operations, you must first calculate this integral. And then once you have done that, uh, you can uh, proceed to calculate the limit. But you must do the uh, the integral first. Okay, so doing that, uh, that's nice. Uh, one over x, we can use the fundamental theorem. What's the antiderivative of one over x? Log absolute x, right? So this would be limit delta to infinity log absolute x, and then this from one to delta, like that. Okay, so then delta is by, uh, by hypothesis more than 1, uh, and 1 is uh, more than 0. So in fact, in this particular case, those absolute values are superfluous. 
So then we can, we can drop them. So this would be the limit as delta goes to infinity of uh, logarithm delta minus logarithm 1. Now, what is the logarithm of 1? Zero. It's 0. So this is the limit as delta goes to infinity of the logarithm of uh, delta. OK, so now you've just got to know. What is the limit of the logarithm as its uh, argument goes to infinity? So infinity? Yeah, it diverges to infinity. No, it's not zero. <laughs> it's infinite. So which is to say it diverges to infinity. Uh, no. Not negative infinity, because uh, remember, a logarithm looks like this. So if this is the, if this is the delta axis, So as you go to zero, it goes to negative infinity. But uh, as you go to as you go to infinity, to the right, it goes up, painfully slow, <laughs> but nevertheless all the way up. You know, because like logarithm of like you know, you know logarithm of a hundred is uh, you know probably something like I don't know like eight. Logarithm of a uh, logarithm of a thousand is like you know like nine. <laughs> or, you know, something like that. Uh, very slow, but it does make it all the way up. So what I want you to observe here is that uh, concerning these two shapes, concerning those two shapes, uh, you know, what does that one look like? And what does that one look like? Like, my hand isn't even good enough to, to show you the difference between those two, as how they look as pictures. What I mean to say is that, uh, you know, 1 over x squared versus 1 over x, you know, from 1 to infinity, you know, according to my skill, they basically look exactly the same. And uh, we're talking about this area and this area. Yeah, so what I'm saying is that according to my skills as an artist, uh, you know, I can't really make them look much different. They look a little bit different if you use a machine to plot them, but they don't look that different. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, if you look at last time or if you just take the time to calculate this one right here, you'll find that uh, the amount of green there is uh, like one, that's how much. So like if this was measured in gallons, you could, you could use one gallon of green paint to paint it. But uh, for this one, it, it, uh, no amount of green paint would suffice. Infinitely much paint. And uh, if that's surprising to you, uh, then in the end, all, all, all the, the reason for the surprise is that, uh, you know, uh, you're, it's, Human beings are built in with an intuition about finite matters, but not infinite matters. So part of a math education is figuring out, uh, oh, okay, well, if something is, uh, has infinite extent or consists of infinitely many pieces or there's infinities going on, then your intuition can break significantly like this. Uh, fine. So then this all comes to a head uh, in the following remark, is that, uh, well, if it works for two, you know, you, apparently that requires a finite an area that that uh, ends up with a finite area, and if and uh, if for one that's a you know evidently an infinite amount of area, then the question is is you know which ones will it work? Would it work for three? Would it work for two and a half? The the answer to the question is this. So, generally, we have this. Under what circumstance will that converge? Okay, and uh, 
The answer is, uh, is this. So this converges. Converges when P is more than 1. Converges when P is more than 1, and it uh, diverges otherwise. So uh, that's, a, that's a useful uh, tool you can use to be able to you know, answer questions quickly. Uh, so you know, something, like, something like this, say. Uh, I, could, I could ask you, how about uh, integral 1 to infinity of, um, say, uh, 3 over 4 square roots of x? So this is a, uh, and you know the, these these integrals are so important that in fact they have a name, and uh, these integrals are called p integrals. Okay, so then uh, concerning this, how can we answer? Right. So then, you know, those constants are this, just there to, you know, mess with you. So then factoring them out and then writing this as 1 over x with uh, exponent half dx like so, then uh, do you observe that, uh, you know, besides the multiplication by 3 fourths, which is not relevant, this is a p integral with p is half. And then, uh, you know, uh, is that you know, w we gave the exact conditions of convergence. So the condition is that p, p more than 1 is the convergent condition. And uh, as a result, this diverges. And there's nothing more to say. So this diverges. Diverges. OK. But uh, you need to be careful because uh, invariably we're also going to do this. So now it's uh, pretty similar looking, right? I still stuck that three in there and the four, you know, to try and, you know, mess with you. And I changed it to cube root. So instead of, instead of exponent half, it's what? Third. So how about it? Huh? The bound is not infinity. Ah, yeah, see? I caught you, right? But that's the point of, you know, one of the points of lecture is do you observe I got you to bite on the p integral? It's, it's not even a p integral. Is what, and again, why is it not a p integral? Right, it's not one to infinity. It's 0 to 1. So it's different. Uh, now, we don't really talk about it a lot, but uh, essentially what happens is, is that, uh, is that uh, there's kind of two manifestations of p integrals. There's this kind, the one, that, uh, the one that we wrote down on the previous page up there. Okay, so 1 to infinity, 1 over p, 1 over x to p like that. And then, uh, you know, you can also consider this variety, 0 to 1. And then I'll write it. I'll write it as q, uh, one over q like that, dx like that. And uh, they're very similar, but th these are the only ones called p integrals. You know, and if in your head you wanted to call these q integrals, that'd be okay. But uh, the the convergent condition is in fact is is in fact opposite. Okay. Uh, I'll leave it to you to try and figure out what that means. Okay. All that and all that I mean is that. Uh, when, you, when you're trapped between 0 and 1, instead of you know, between 1 and infinity, uh, the, these two uh, conditions swap. OK, so then let's do that uh, super quick. So then this would be 3 quarters, integral 0 to 1. And then I'll write it as x to negative third dx, like so. 
we can use the uh, fundamental theorem. Fundamental theorem says that this would be what, x to 2 thirds over 2 thirds. And then this all evaluated 0 to 1. Uh, dividing by that fraction is the same as multiplying by its reciprocal. So this would be 9 eighths, uh, x to 2 thirds, 0 to 1. Well, at 1, that's 1, and at 0, that's 0. So this, uh, this would just be 9 eighths. Okay, so then if you, if you were misled into thinking that this was a p integral, uh, then you, you would make the wrong conclusion, and even furthermore, you would show no work <laughs> because you would think there was no work to show, so you just get a zero for that exercise if, if you didn't catch. Okay, finally, uh, before we go to the next thing, uh, I want to give you uh, uh, a different, uh, you know, so something to consider. Uh, so here, this, this kind of thing comes up a lot. So, say, the integral from... negative 2 to 3 of x over x squared come on brain I really want to what do I want to do here I want this to be uh, Well, okay, I'll make this negative half. I guess that's the least painful edit. Negative half, like that. There we go. Uh, minus one, dx. Okay, so now the place where you can go wrong on this, this exercise is, you know, in the heat of an exam. And, uh, you know, you're like, oh, you know, rumbling to the end there, you know, getting, want to wanna do it. And you look at that, and you look at that, and you say, hey, that looks like a substitution. All right, so I'll just do it real quick. So what I'm about to write is incorrect. So if you, if you write it, if you're, if, you're gonna, if, you're gonna, if you're gonna do this in your notes, be sure and note that it's wrong. So, hey, look, I can do a substitution. So u, that'd be, uh, that'd be uh, what, x, uh, u is x squared minus one, and then du over two, and that'd be uh, x dx. You know, it's like a, it's a made to order substitution. And then I'll uh, change the limits also. So u evaluated at negative half. Plugging in negative half, uh, that would be a quarter minus 1. So that would be negative 3 fourths. And then plugging in 3, that would be 9 minus 1, that would be 8. OK, so then this would be, uh, after that substitution, the integral of negative 3 quarters to 8, and then 1 over u. Uh, 1 over u, uh, du over 2. And then the half comes out. And uh, so the half comes out, and ignoring that, uh, what's the antiderivative of 1 over u du? Log absolute u. So that'd be log absolute u, negative 3 quarters to 8. And then, oh, it's a good thing we had that absolute because otherwise we'd have a problem there. So this would be, uh, you know, because logarithm is only defined for positive inputs. So this would be logarithm 8 minus logarithm of 3 quarters because the absolute value, uh, you know, matches the negative. Nevertheless, this is, this is just uh, absolutely and fundamentally uh, misguided and wrong. What's wrong with this? This whole thing is just blah, zero. What's wrong with this? What, what's the name of the section that we're in? Improper integrals. And what does it mean to be improper? This is not proper. What does it mean to be improper? Yeah? Right, but what does it mean to be improper? The shape that, 
Right, at some point, ln is going to have to be evaluated at zero, which is in the bottom line, because your zero is between that negative one half and three. It's, uh, it's not that it's, uh, it's, it's not uh, that it's, well, yes, okay, I agree with that. But to even before that, even before you get there, uh, notice that, uh, you know, for, for this thing that, that uh, is in between my fingers here like that, uh, can, can you plug in one? No. Can you plug in negative one? No. No. Right? And in particular, uh, this, this thing, okay, this thing will have vertical asymptotes at those locations at negative one and one, which means that uh, it would not be permissible to integrate up, up to them like we were doing before. And it surely wouldn't be permissible to just integrate straight across it, right? Just, nah, I just go just past that vertical asymptote. See the problem? So uh, in here, in this interval, at one, there's a vertical asymptote. And what we just did, in a sense, is we just integrated right across it. That's why uh, I had written something there, and I was thinking, where, where do I want to put this one? So I wasn't integrating across two of them. Okay, so then, so this is, uh, this is just utterly wrong, this whole thing. Uh, because, uh, you know, just blah. Because a student fails to recognize that it's improper. So now, the way to go about this uh, correctly is, you know, to consider a sketch. And so how does this look? So at, uh, we've got one there, and negative one, and zero. And uh, we want to consider how does, how does y equal to x over x squared minus 1 look? Well, uh, well, over here it would look like this. So we'd have that. And then, uh, you know, at 0, it's 0, so we'd have that. Like that. And then uh, in here, say like at half, right? At half, that'd be, uh, that'd be positive and that'd be negative. So in fact, uh, it's, gonna, it's gonna go down like this. Okay, and then uh, s similar, uh, wait, let's think about it. Uh, over here, be negative and negative. So in fact, what does it do? Go up like this? So it does this. That way. And then uh, over here, it does what? Uh, so over here, that would be positive over negative, so it would be negative. So it's going to do this. So this is what uh, that graph looks like. And then where, what were we integrating? <laughs> well, we were, we were integrating from negative half to 3. So we were going from here Uh, and that's one, and then, you know, three's over here. So what we were doing is we were, we were doing that and that up, you know, and then up to that asymptote and then even across it. So do you observe that this shape that uh, we're talking about, so it stops right there. It's improper because it's vertically unbounded. So the only way to, to uh, answer the question here is that, uh, in fact, we have to cut, we have to cut it into two separate regions, and each of them are individually improper. So like, uh, like that one right there, ignoring everything else, that's improper, because it's not bounded below. And uh, ignoring everything else, that one is not proper, because it's not bounded abo above. So as a result, we have to cut it there with two different cuts, and, comp and calculate two different integrals and two different limits. So, the integral in question uh, has to be done like this. So negative half to 3 x over x squared minus 1 dx. In fact, uh, we, we have to do it like this. Integral negative half to a x over x squared minus 1 dx. Ooh, I missed. I need to put a limit in here. So equal to limit as a goes to the problem from the left 
and then plus the limit as b goes to the problem from the right b to 3 same thing now that looks uh, kind of complicated but to understand what it's what we're saying is that we take this shape we're saying that uh, this one So we're uh, calculating this shape. And then we're going to let A go to 1. Can you see it? So that's that integral. That's a proper shape now. And then let A go to 1. And for this one, now we're going to take this side, this other uh, bit. One is still the problem for it. Now we're going to integrate from b to 3 instead. So these are the truncated proper versions. You let A go to 1, you let B go to 1. A is going to 1 from the left, B is going to 1 from the right. So what I want you to see from this example is that in principle I could, I could uh, give you an improper integral. And because I've shown you an example where you, where you have to cut it into two pieces, uh, that, uh, that, that means I could give you one where you have to cut it into three, and, and even arbitrarily many. But uh, generally speaking, uh, two is the maximum that uh, we ever do, unless, unless, and here's the, here's the thing where I just need your attention for 30 more seconds. Suppose you cut it into more than one piece, like so. Then uh, the way you address the problem is you calculate each one individually. So, you know, 10 pieces, and you say, okay, I'll calculate the one, you know, number one, and then piece number two, and then piece number three, and piece number four. In order for the, in order for the, improper integral to converge. It must be the case that every individual piece converges. If every individual piece does, if even one diverges, the whole thing is out. In the same sense that uh, if I said, you know, if there's 50 of us in here and I said, you know, I cut some big fence into 50 pieces and assign all of us to a piece, if even one of you says, my piece has infinite size, then the, then the problem can't be solved, right? So in fact, uh, for, for ungraded homework, you should verify that when you do this, in fact, both of these pieces have infinite size. They both have, uh, have infinite size. Okay, so uh, have a nice Monday.